so why the blue corn? Well, I lived in Hopi land for and Navajo land for a decade, 10 years, and as a public school teacher. And particularly on Hopi, I moved uh, up to one of the villages for a year, Sipalavi, on 2nd Mesa, and um, got acquainted with the women in their kitchens. My neighbor, she, her kids were all down below in the Anglo housing where they could have running water and TVs. And so grandma and grandpa were still up on the mesas and they were lonesome. And I was better than nothing, the white school teacher next door. And plus that is just the Hopi way. You, someone that's all alone, you know, you're not gonna let anyone eat all alone. And so here she was at my, at my door going, come and eat. Actually, it was hardly my door because it was a, it was a triplex. Beauty, that one's a beauty. It was a triplex and um, like Hopi style, like kind of a Pueblo, kind of a modern Pueblo. You might think of it looked like kind of like that three three little apartments or houses all in a row and parking out in front and uh, in the back there was a long narrow back porch that led into all of our kitchens so everybody would run back and forth on the back porch without ever going outside oh look at this little one pretty blue blue and uh, oh cute little unformed and each kernel, I mean, honest, it's a work of art. It's out in Hopi, of course, they just dry it. This time of year, all the flat surfaces up on top of the houses and everything are spread with blue corn drying. And then they keep it in corn cribs, store it right on the, on the husks. And in the winter, as they need blue corn flour, really finely ground, they'll sit there and shuck, these, shuck the dry kernels off the corn and of course in the old days there was a whole lot of corn grinding going on you know and corn grinding songs to make the time go these days there's electric grinders like when I lived in Hopi I'd go with grandma she had her friend over on first mesa so we'd get in the in my truck actually and we'd go down the mesa and across the flat across the you know wide open Indian country out there sage and yucca and the washes and the red sands and over to Elsie's on First Mesa in Palaka. Elsie had the grinder and Ma would leave, we were called, Joyce was my neighbor, we all called her Ma. Ma would leave her blue corn and then pick it up, we'd go pick it up a few days later. But I don't grind mine, I don't have a grain grinder here. If I did, I would grain it. Oh, wow, this one's red. Just a little bit of red. Wow, oh, it's immature, but ooh, it's a fun one. Isn't that a beauty? Wow. Totally sweetheart says, I just love this. And of course, it's, I know everyone is interested in blue corn when I talk about it on my Facebook page and on my blog. And I think in part, it's everyone wants relief from the GMO and the, the corn machine that we've developed in this country for sweet corn and, and just the horrible stuff that's going on with the, with the whole world of genetically modified organisms and how that's invading the world of corn. Here's another little ready, half formed, you know, so I'll just snap that off so for freezer space. So out in Hopi, they look for the perfect little tiny ones, not that these are, this is, and they'll fix them for the little babies for ceremonial purposes. Because, of course, just like wheat is to us, corn is the staff of life uh, in Indian country, and of course was the main grain here on the continent before Europeans, mainstream culture, transplanted its wheat you can see the corn isn't really completely developed because of our short year and because this isn't especially corn country. And in Indian country, well here this is probably my most fully developed one, or this one maybe. This one's kind of pale. 
In Indian country, they're really nice, beautiful, long cobs. And they'll, they'll look for the most perfect one, and it'll be the mother corn. 